Welcome to Wednesday in the Word. I welcome you to my office on this Tuesday, the 6th of April. So it's the Tuesday after Easter, and I trust that you had a wonderful Easter. We had a fantastic Easter at Spring Valley. If you go back a year ago, everything was closed down. We were not able to have service, and though we are still wearing masks and somewhat socially distancing, we were able to have service, and it was great to be able to be together to celebrate the resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Christ Jesus. It is a beautiful day. It is sunny. It is bright. It is 72 degrees, the flowers are in bloom, and we can say this is the day the Lord has made, and we rejoice, and we're glad in it. As we go to the Lord in prayer, I want to give thanks to the Lord for you. I want to thank you for your weekly attendance to the Bible study. I want to thank you for so many of you that share with us that the Bible study is a blessing. And that is the purpose and the reason that we do these Bible studies, that we can come into your homes or wherever you may be and impart to you the Word of God. The Word is powerful. It is sharper than any two-edged sword. The Word is a lamp unto our feet, it's a light unto our pathway. The Word enlightens, the Word brings joy, the Word brings peace. And for some of you, I know that is exactly what you need. You need the peace of God to come into your home where you are. Many of you have shared with us prayer requests and needs, that you have, and we take those very seriously. We present those needs before God, and we call your names out to God in prayer. So I want you to know there are those that care deeply for you, that you are loved, and that you are held in the hollow of the hands of Almighty God. So let us go to God in prayer. Heavenly Father, I am grateful and thankful that I can come to you in prayer and seek your face. Thank you for this past Sunday and for the blessings of Almighty God. Thank you for the victories that had been reported. Thank you for the joy that was in the service. Thank you, Heavenly Father, that we serve a risen Savior, a God who is alive, a God who loved us, who identified with us, who died for us, but death could not hold him. He arose, and he is seated at the right hand where, Lord, at this moment, you are making intercession for us. So I pray that our people that are listening would realize that you are closer than the very breath that they are breathing, and that you have them in your heart and in your mind, and that you care for them. So God, lighten the load, lighten the burden, and give peace where there is no peace, and give comfort to those that need the comfort of Almighty God. For it is in the name of Jesus, our Lord and our Savior, we do pray, and amen. Each week we come to you from our office and we share with you some of our collectibles. And I want to share some couple of things with you to me that is very interesting. As a young boy, I grew up on the banks of the Rappahannock, uh, Rappahannock River in eastern Virginia, and did not realize until I grew up that the very place that I was raised was one of the main 
Native American uh, villages. In fact, when Captain John Smith sailed up the Rappahannock in 1608, he stopped at the place that uh, is known as Islington Farm, where there was one of the main villages. It was called the King's House. And uh, I want to show you a picture. This is a depiction of the village that was uh, in Islington, where I grew up as a boy. It was a very, very special place. As a child playing, we often found remnants of uh, Indian relics. And I want to share a couple of those that are with you, uh, uh, those that are listening to me. This is a relic that came out of the Rappahannock River. It is a piece of pottery, ancient American Indian pottery. And uh, for years it had been in the river, had washed up on the shores, and you can see how that it was made. And uh, again, I treasure this, but something that I treasure even more is this. This is a very ancient mortar stone, and there is a story behind it. The Indians were driven from their villages along the Rappahannock, and they went inland of the peninsula and what was known as Indian fields. And part of my father's farm was on the land that was owned by the Indians. And one day, my father was in the field disking, and the disk ran over this object. In fact, you can see the disk mark that is on this. And he got off of his tractor, and he got down and looked. And lo and behold, there was this ancient relic of American <clears throat> Indian um, that was used as a grinding. Uh, they would put the corn in this and they would use a pestle and they would grind their grain. And so for years this was in the home of my mother and father and when they passed away it came to me and I absolutely treasured this. Again, I hold this in my hand. And I think of the Native American uh, women that would have held this grinding stone or this uh, mortar and uh, the grain that they would have ground up. And so uh, my, uh, on my father's side, they came to this country in 1660 from England. And uh, George Henson was the first Henson who came in the 1660s as an indentured servant. So I have a, a rich history and a rich background. And if you know anything about me, I am very, very proud of my heritage and thankful for the blessings of Almighty God. And I hope that you are proud of who you are because each of you have a story and you are special, whatever your particular history may be. And now I want to transition to the Bible study and we're again going to the Gospel of St. Luke and we're going to be looking at one of the post-resurrection appearances of our Lord. And I trust that God would bless us in our Bible study. Turn with me, if you will, to the Gospel according to St. Luke, chapter 24. As I mentioned to you, this past Sunday was Easter, and our focus was on the resurrection of our Lord and our Savior. And the resurrection of the Lord is found in the 24th chapter of Luke's Gospel. But there are a couple follow-up resurrection appearances of the Lord. 
And so I want to begin with verse 13 of Luke 24 and continue to read down through verse 35. And let me remind you, as we are looking at this passage of Scripture, this is only found in the Gospel of Luke. It is not found in Mark's Gospel. It's not found in Matthew's Gospel. It is not found in John's Gospel. And it is known as Jesus' walk on the road to Emmaus. So it takes place the day of the resurrection. And so beginning with verse 13, Now that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. And if you happen to look on a biblical map, you will find that Emmaus is uh, west of Jerusalem. And uh, it is uh, not even a day's journey. And they were talking with each other about everything that happened. And they talked and discussed these things with each other. Jesus himself came up and walked along with them, but they were kept from recognizing him. So let's look at the setting of this passage of Scripture. The day of the resurrection, so this is on the Sunday, there are two men, we are told the name of one of these, and verse 18 it is a man by the name of Cleopas. That is the only time Cleopas is mentioned in the Bible. Other than this, we know nothing about Cleopas at all. But these two men, they are downcast, they are dejected in their spirit, and uh, we do not know uh, why they were in Jerusalem. Maybe they were in Jerusalem because of the Passover that was going on, but they're going back to Emmaus. And it seems from reading this passage of Scripture that Emmaus was where their home was located. Because when they get back to Emmaus, they're going to have a meal in which Jesus is invited. So they're walking along the road, and suddenly uh, this third person joins them. And it's Jesus, but they do not recognize that it is Jesus. And I thought that in the ordinary circumstances of life, when you're not expecting, God shows up in our life. When you're at your lowest for whatever reason, when you are going through a period of depression in your life, a period of questioning in which you're saying, I cannot understand why things have happened and why I am going through what I'm going through. It is in those moments that unexpectedly God shows up in your life and he gives you a revelation of who he is. So they're talking and as they're walking and talking and discussing these things, the Bible says Jesus himself came up and walked along with them. I love that. Jesus came up and walked along with them. Unexpectedly, Jesus shows up. May I tell you that when you are least expecting, God shows up in your life. When you need him the most, God shows up in your life. The Bible says they were, uh, they did not recognize him. In fact, they were kept from recognizing him. Now, we know that the Lord is in his glorified form, in his resurrected form. And if maybe for that reason, they didn't recognize him or that Jesus particularly 
uh, concealed his identity from them. But for whatever reason, they were kept from recognizing him. Let me ask you, could it be that in individuals that you did not know, God has showed up? In situations that you were not expecting, God showed up. And as they're walking along, we come to verse 17. The Lord asked them, What are you discussing together as you walk along? Now, it is not that Jesus is asking for information because the Lord, he certainly knew what they were discussing. In fact, he is God. He is the omniscient God. He knows everything. But he is asking this for clarification and engaging them because he's going to take them from where they are in their thinking to where they should be. And uh, uh, they stood still, and the Bible said, their faces downcast. And one of them, and this is where we are introduced to Cloopus, Ask him, are you the only visitor in Jerusalem and do not know the things that have happened there in these days? And basically what Clopas is saying, where have you been? Don't you know what has taken place? Don't you know that they have crucified the one that we expected to be the Messiah, the one that we expected to be the Redeemer of Israel? And Jesus asked another question. He says, what things? And then Cleopas answers about Jesus of Nazareth. And I want you to know how he answers. Notice that he is downcast. Notice that he is depressed. Notice that he is feeling this loss in his life. And he has lost hope. And so he does not answer uh, with great certainty, oh, this is the Messiah, this is God that they have crucified. They said about Jesus of Nazareth. So he is talking in terms of his earthly identity. Jesus, his human name. Jesus, where he is from, the city of Nazareth. And he says he was a prophet. Notice, he cannot say he is the Son of God. He cannot say this was the Messiah. He says he was a prophet, but he says he was powerful in word and deed before God and the people. And the chief priest and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death. So he is giving to Jesus the facts of the uh, chief priest arresting Jesus. There is a trial. Jesus has been crucified. And he said, they've crucified him. But notice what he says. But we had hoped that he was the one that was going to redeem Israel. So what is he saying? We have lost the hope that we had. We hoped that this was the one that was going to redeem Israel. And notice his answer. He is looking at Jesus as the one that is going to restore the glory of Israel and overthrow the Roman, Roman power and bring back the glory of Israel once again that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what is more, it is the third day since all this took place. In addition, some of our women amazed us, and they went to the tomb early this morning, but they didn't find his body. So Cleopas is reporting the facts. There has been a crucifixion. There has been a burial. And now there is the report 
that his body is missing. Some of the women went to the tomb. And if you read the word of God, the first to go to the tomb was Mary Magdalene, which is found in Mark chapter 6, verse 9 through 11, and in John chapter 20, verse 11 through 18. And now he is appearing to these two men on the road of Emmaus. So the women have reported that his body is missing. And in verse 25, he said to them, and notice the rebuke of the Lord. They still do not know that it's Jesus that's talking to them. How foolish you are. Have you ever gotten to the place that the Lord has gently rebuked you and you said, really, are you so foolish that you have lost faith so easily? That you have lost hope? so easily, and so slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. And what he says, uh, that did not the Christ have to suffer these things and to enter his glory? And verse 27, what does the Lord do? As they continue this walk on the road of Emmaus, the seven miles from Jerusalem to the village of Emmaus, beginning with Moses and all of the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning him. So notice how important it is that you have a foundation in the word of God. So what the Lord does is that he takes them to what we call the Old Testament, the 39 books, and beginning with Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, what we refer to as the books of the law, continuing through the prophets all the way to the end of the Old Testament, he explained the scriptures concerning who he was. And I've sort of wondered in my mind, maybe he went to what we refer to as Psalm 22, and he read to them portions of Psalm 22 uh, that are so vivid in terms of uh, the crucifixion of our Lord. And certainly, he probably took them to the passage that we looked at in Isaiah, and he read to them from Isaiah the things that the Lord had suffered. And he said, don't you realize that the Christ, the anointed one, the one that you thought that was going to redeem Israel, that his mission most of all and most important is to redeem the lost souls of mankind. And the only way that he could do that was by offering himself as a sacrifice on the cross of Calvary. And uh, he explained to them all that was said in the scriptures concerning him. So let me challenge you. During the rest of this year, delve into the scripture, both Old and New Testament. Read the word of God until it becomes new and fresh to you that you can see the Lord Jesus in all of his glory and all of his power. Now, as he is finishing, they are approaching the village of Emmaus. And Jesus acted as though that he was going further. But these two men, Cloopus and the other, urged him strongly. Still, they do not know who he is, Stay with us. Now, let me just point out how important hospitality was in biblical times, that you extend courtesy to those that were strangers and to those that you did not know. And so they invited him into their homes, or into their home. And I've often thought, what would have happened if they had not invited him to come in and to have a meal. 
What would have happened in your life if you had not taken the opportunity to invite Jesus into your home, into your heart, and into your life? Stay with us, for it's nearly evening. So the day is almost spent. The sun is beginning to set. And the Bible said that Jesus went in to stay with them. Now they're at the table. And a meal is being served. This is the evening meal. The low table at which they are reclining. And we do not know what they had other than they had bread. But one thing that we are told, he gave thanks. Can you give thanks for what you have? Regardless of how mega it might be. And I, I love this. It is from passages of scripture like this, that as Christians, before we begin to take our meal, we simply pause and we say, thank you, Lord. Thank you for what you have provided. Thank you for the meal that I am about to partake of. And he took the bread and notice he broke it and began to give to them. So the guest becomes the host. I love this because he is the guest, but he does what the host should have been doing. He takes the bread and he breaks it. Now, it is in the breaking of the bread they recognize him. Let me tell you, only the Lord can break bread the way he does. Let me remind you of when he took the loaves and the fish and he broke it, and he fed the multitude on the hillside. Let me remind you, in the Last Supper, when he took the bread, and he broke it, and he said, this is my body. And now, at this common meal, he takes the bread, and he breaks it. It doesn't say what he said. All that it says in verse 31, then their eyes were opened and they recognized him. It was in the breaking of the bread. Let me tell you that it's in the breaking of Jesus' body on Calvary that we recognize him. It is in holy communion. It is in the Holy Eucharist that we recognize him. This is my body, which is broken for you. So their eyes were open and they recognized him. Let me ask you a question. Have your eyes been open? Do you recognize who the Lord is? Do you realize that he is the Son of God. And then all of a sudden, it says, the Lord disappears from them. So, at one moment, he is breaking the bread. The next moment, their eyes is open. And then they look, and he's gone. Mm -hmm. And then notice what it says. They ask each other, were not our hearts burning within us when he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? May I ask you, have your, has your heart ever burned as you've read the word of God? As someone who is taught the word of God, as the word is imparted, have you had that sense of the feeling of the presence of Almighty God. And you said, oh, my heart is burning because the word becomes new. Every day, presently, I'm reading three chapters from the Old Testament and two chapters 
from the New Testament. And this is a practice that I've long held in my life. But I can tell you that my heart is still burning within me as I read the Word of God. Because I see Jesus anew and afresh every day. So, if there is one discipline that I can encourage you to have, read the Scripture. Meditate upon the Word of God until it becomes so real within your life. Now, they've already walked seven miles. It's already dark. But notice what the Scripture says in verse 33. They got up and returned at once to Jerusalem. So they're going to make a round-trip journey. They're going back seven miles from Emmaus to Jerusalem. Why? Because they wanted to tell the other disciples the good news. Have you ever gotten to the place that you just cannot keep it in? God has revealed himself to you, and it is so real that you cannot wait to share it with others. So they got up and returned at once to Jerusalem. And the first thing they did, they found the eleven, and those with them assembled together, and they said, It's true! The Lord has risen and has appeared to Simon. Then the two told what had happened on the way. And notice what it says, how Jesus was recognized by them when he broke the bread. I do not know the next time that you may be in church where there is a Holy Communion, but when the bread is passed to you and you hold that wafer or that piece of bread in your hand, the pastor reads, this is my body, which is broken for you. At that moment, when you take the bread and you break it, pray and ask God to reveal himself to you. And what I know is that he's going to become very real in your life. Because he doesn't love you any less then he loved Cleopas and the friend that was walking with him on the road of Emmaus. There were many people that the Lord could have feared to that day, but he appeared to Cleopas and to his friend. Wherever you are at this moment, you maybe were not expecting for Jesus to show up. But Jesus has showed up because he loves you. And he says, I want to show myself, reveal myself to you. As we pray at the end of this lesson, I'm going to pray that God will reveal himself in such a way that you will say he's more than a prophet. He is my Savior and he is my Lord. Thomas was not there in the upper room on the day that Jesus first appeared to his disciples. But he was there the following week. And earlier he said, unless I touch the scars in his hands, in his feet, in his side, I will not believe. But when he saw the Lord in the Gospel of John, he confessed, my Lord and my God. Well, you confess at this moment, my Lord and my God, shall we pray. Father, we thank you that you reveal yourself in the mundane things. You reveal yourself at times that we are not expecting. And I pray at this very moment, you would reveal yourself to my brothers and sisters in Christ and to those that are listening to me. Bless, I pray. Come and lay your hands upon those that are under the sound of my voice. 
and speak as only you can. For it's in Jesus' name I pray. And amen. May God bless you. And may he keep you. Until next week, God willing.